always. So I am Catherine Prescott. I'm the chief curator here at Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center. And I am joined as always by my wonderful co-host, Mary Salzitz Ottomanelli, board member at the Hendrick I. Lott House in Brooklyn, New York. And tonight we are going to talk about immigrant foodways. Um, so the, the foodways of some of the different immigrant groups that were coming to our shores. Uh, and we're focusing kind of on New York and Connecticut around the turn of the 20th century, although we will um, venture into modern day and into some theory, food waste theory as well, a little bit. Um, I had to uh, go back to some of my intro anthropology <laughs> texts um, for some of these articles. Um, so... Uh, before we dive into uh, the immigrant foodways, I would like to begin, as always, with our land acknowledgement. Uh, Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center would like to truthfully acknowledge that our site's history and present experiences uh, do not begin with uh, the Europeans. Uh, the town of Ridgefield exists on the ancestral homelands of the Ramapo, Munsi Lenape, and Wishkwaiskek people. Uh, they were the original stewards of this land on which Keeler Tower Museum and History Center stands today. And we thank them for their strength and their resilience in stewarding this land. And we hope to continue their legacy of protecting this site and its history. Uh, so uh, as we uh, move from the indigenous people of this land to the immigrants that have um, influenced uh, America uh, through many, many ways. Um, we're talking about the food tonight. And uh, if you joined us a couple episodes ago, last season, right, um, when Henry Ward joined us, uh, we talked about indigenous food ways and how food is really uh, important in developing uh, identity and cultural identity um, and, and how for the indigenous people, they are, are trying to revitalize that. And we'll talk a little bit about that today in the term, in the sense of some of the different immigrant groups um, that have found their way to America and have settled in, in New York and uh, Connecticut. So um, I think we'll start. Um... Seems Catherine is frozen. I think Oh, there she goes. Oh, you froze. Oh no! It's the weather, everybody. Yeah. Did I? If I see some cameras on, did I freeze or was it just Catherine? Just Catherine. Okay, so if you freeze, I will start going. Okay, great. Let's hope that the connection stays. <laughs> yeah. So, we should probably, I mean, dive into the fact of how personal food is, especially to different cultures and how this concept, we're going to dive right into like the concept of Americanization and uh, assimilation kind of play into immigrant foodways when we were looking at it. I mean, especially in a New York City sense, it's a lot. Um, when you talk about immigrant foodways and you Google it around New York City, you get a lot of dominant groups, especially in the Lower East Side and how people wanted to Americanize and the way that they did it outwardly was always through changes that they could immediately make. So they would buy new clothes and they would learn the language and they would kind of, I hate saying fake it till you make it, but kind of working in that way, where as the food and changing what people ate always became a little bit more difficult because it was that tie to your homeland to where you came from. And it's also the food that you know and that you remember. So it was interesting to watch or to learn and to read about different groups like the Italians and the Irish and the German and the Jewish population, especially in the Lower East Side, kind of find that balance. And me and Catherine have had this conversation several times of being the children of immigrants and how we also have to manage that first generation link as well. Um, but it was, you know, you always kind of want to make sure that everybody holds on to their their roots, essentially. 
Yeah, I think one of the things that really popped up a lot in the the reading was the idea of um, nostalgia and identity um, for immigrant groups as they uh, tried to adapt to a new country um, and new cultures, and especially at the turn of the 20th century when um, the 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 xenophobia and the racism was so extraordinarily overt. Um, I don't want to say higher than it is today, but it was definitely a lot more overt. Um, and so there was a lot of pressure on these immigrant groups to Americanize and to become, um, you know, as American as possible, as quickly as possible. Uh, but there's also that desire to hold on to um, the culture that they've come from. And so you end up seeing that a lot in the food, that tension in the food. And it's how we come to have cuisines that are now kind of these hybrid um, cuisines that are not fully, you know, from the old country, but they're not American either. So we have, you know, Italian American food and American Chinese food, right, that are very distinct in their own way. Um, and so, and then later on, you get into these questions of authenticity, right? Um, you know, you've created these hybrid things, but now second generation, third generation want to go back. Um, Oh no, have I frozen? Have I frozen again? You froze again. Oh no. <laughs> sorry, everybody. We're so sorry. This is it's a Zoom program. We apologize for any technical. Yeah, I'm not sure why, but our internet is so unstable. It um, might be the storm. It might be the storm. So uh, we'll we'll keep going um, as best we can. Yeah, that to jump off of what Catherine was talking about, there is definitely a connection when you're reading about this, especially, you know, late 19th century, early 20th, early 20th century of the connection between the progressive temperance reform movements mixing in with, I mean, it's almost like a forced assimilation of these ethnic groups that were coming in, especially in New York City. Um, you see food as a way of reforming them. So they see things like there was one instance where there was somebody in the temperance movement who was complaining that Italian Americans who would come in were importing their own food at a higher cost instead of eating food that was made here or like popular food um, from American diets. And when we talk about that during that time, we're talking about very bland diets, no spice, no fancy ingredients, because it was bad for digestion, it was bad for your mental health, it was, you know, only bad people who go to jail eat spicy foods was kind of the the overall theme of what was going on. So they would see these new ingredients and these new spices come in, and they would watch Italians make pasta, and they would be like, well, why are you eating this when you can have the prefab food that we already have that will be better for your stomachs? And you can see a lot of back and forth and they targeted women specifically, I noticed in New York City when I was looking this up, because men, even though they were more part of the world at that point, because they would go out and they would work and they would be around people, public transportation and going to the markets and stuff. It's truly the women in the domestic sphere that were making the food and in charge of what they were buying and what they were making and what was being prepared for children. So you would see a lot of reformers try and go, I say reformers, but like, who doesn't love pasta? Uh, reformers go into these houses, into these tenement buildings to specifically speak to Irish women, to Italian women, to Jewish women, and see if they could change their diets and get them to make these, what I would consider very bland food because, you know, garlic was bad, tomato sauce bad. Um, why would you import pasta when you can have whole wheat crackers that are here for I mean, in all honesty, like a lower dense nutritional value, um, you get a lot more out of a pasta than you would an oatmeal. That's just me. 
Um, but it was it was interesting to read about that clash and Italian women specifically really pushed back and they really pushed back on the temperance movement and the progressive movements in New York City. And thank goodness they did because New York City is wonderful Italian food. And I mean, as somebody who has a hyphenated last name of Ottomanelli, I am privileged to some of the best Italian food on the East Coast. Um, but it's it's really interesting to see that layer of where there's a there's a thought form here, I swear, of where your culture lies and how much do you want to assimilate. And you can really see that through the diets of immigrants coming in from about 1840 till I think we'll give it a hundred years because by the 1940s, 1950s, you see a real shift of exotic food being bad to exotic food being really, really cool and really interesting and respected and very uh, wanted and sought after as seen by the amount of Italian restaurants, Chinese, authentic Chinese restaurants, authentic German and Irish and Greek restaurants that you can find in the city. Yeah, I think one of the things that I notice is that shift throughout time and it's kind of how, um, how immigrants were were being perceived at different points. Um, and so especially, you know, before the World Wars, right at the turn of the century, you have um, the only people who are really going to eat Italian food who aren't Italians um, are the Bohemians and the intellectuals who want to show their worldliness, right? And they, they, um, or they want to go and slum it with the immigrants. Um, and then once you get to the World War, you know, the interwar period uh, with the depression, then, you know, these immigrant foods become emblems of economizing, right? These people have perfected the way to eat, you know, with, with very little. Um, and then once you get to post World War II, uh, you know these these immigrant food ways become cosmopolitan, right? They, and it's something that every middle class housewife should learn how to do to have should have at her, you know, dinner party or whatever. Um, and some of it comes from you know the soldiers are coming back from places like Italy where they experience pizza and pasta and things like that. Um, and so they they actually you know wanted that as well. Um, and so the the shift in in you know the the way people thought of these foods um, has it was definitely. Uh, very interesting how it kind of lined up with these different periods. Um, and the other thing was also just the adaptation, right, of of immigrants. They're coming uh, from, and, and how the women especially, because they were the ones doing most of the cooking, um, especially in Italian households, uh, how Italian-American cuisine really reflects the differences in um, ingredient availability, right? So we have uh, Italian American staple of, you know, spaghetti and meatballs, right? With these large beef meatballs and things like that, which aren't, that's not really a thing in, in Italy. Um, and part of that is because beef, you could get more of it and you could get it cheap um, in the United States. And so why not, you know, take advantage of that? Um, and things like chicken parmesan and veal parmesan, you know, in Italy, it's eggplant because chicken and veal, it's just, it was more expensive for them. Like many of the people who ended up immigrating couldn't afford that and they, but they can now. And so they're going to take advantage of that. Um, uh, and so you start to see these shifts and a lot of it is just because they now had access to, um, to these ingredients, uh, it's interesting to see how those recipes changed over time. So having access to meat kind of makes that spaghetti and meatballs available. And then this is a really gross example, but like, I don't know if it's a thing in Ridgefield, but New York City pizzerias love to put like pasta on pizza slices here. 
Like it's one of those like weird, I don't know why, like Buffalo chicken pizza. Like you can see the, the basis is you're there, but then they start adding on different meals onto a pizza slice. And I'm just like, we've, we've adapted too much. We need to scale back. just like full blocks on like it's like penne pasta with vodka sauce on a slice of pizza and that's when I was looking at these recipes of how they changed um and I have a few examples from the lot house and I'll pull them up right now um just of like how diet shifts so this is a recipe from the flatland chef which was a cookbook produced by the women of the Dutch Reformed Church in Brooklyn in 1968 so there is a recipe up here for American chop suey, and there's a recipe for la majune. La majune. I absolutely butchered that, and I absolutely apologize for it. Of uh, this concept of when you when you look at ingredients and looking at scaling back what they considered spicy food or exotic recipes and ingredients, and you have this American chop suey that just looks so like it needs a couple of more ingredients it needs something else it just kind of like one medium-sized onion chop and I'm like you could do more like even in in Brooklyn we would have access to a lot more vegetables to throw in as well um the lots were large producers of cabbage and potatoes so that could have easily been thrown in um but I don't know I look at these recipes and I look at family recipes and I look at how my grandmother my very greek grandmother from the village tried to adapt american recipes but would always put like a hint of greek on there so things would always have a little bit of oregano seasoning on it or there would be like olive oil or i mean like i think i've told Catherine this once but my grandmother straight from the village loved the concept of shake and bake like it was the greatest thing in the entire world for her. So she would make shake and bake. And then we would go back to these very traditional, like peasant Greek meals throughout the week. And we, we would switch back and forth. And anytime I look at these recipes, especially from 20th century on, I'm always just like interested in how they've been adapted, how they've changed or what food palettes look like in different places. Um, I also have this one as well. So this is from Mrs. Norton's cookbook in the early 1900s when tastes were still shifting. Um, there is the first sentence that I wanted to point out. Good cooking does not consist in the preparation of highly seasoned foods designed to pamper perverted appetites, but in cooking the simple things in a palatable way. Uh, again, they didn't want spices, uh, heavily spiced food, but they still were dabbling in the concept of, I would like to try an Italian meal. I would like to try a Chinese meal. I would like to try a German meal that was based in meat, but we don't want it so heavily German. We don't want it so heavily Chinese. And I think we've come past that, I think. Um, I hope, I hope everybody's trying to. Um, I can show this a little later on. Yeah, it's interesting to see ingredient chips and how people react to them at different stages and definitely over like a hundred year period. Thankfully, we've gone from very exotic going into these restaurants as like almost like a dare and saying, well, I survived it and I ate it. Then a hundred years later, going in and really appreciating the flavors, the food and the whole palate that it was originally intended to have and being okay with yeah, I I think um, your story about your grandmother loving shake and bake is one of those things that I think I noticed a lot is that, you know, the women are kind of both ends of that acculturation spectrum, right? Because there's part of them in the kitchen, they're trying to recreate home, right? They're trying to recreate this you know, what they knew before. But at the same time, they're the target of the marketing for all of these food innovations that are happening at the same time, right? Canned foods, freezer meals, um, all these new technologies and things like that. And so you, you see them like both ends of that spectrum of, you know, grabbing onto Americanness with both hands, but also trying to recreate this 
this idea of home, uh, which may or may not be possible in in America. Yeah, there's definitely that thin line, and I we've told we've we've spoken about this a few times of where the balance is of you know, I can definitely see it in my mother wanting to be a little bit more American than Greek and kind of assimilating a little bit more into the society uh, compared to some of my other friends who are Greek American as well. And then me having a child and being like, no, we have to like make sure that she still has this cultural tie to the Greek culture. And she goes to Greek school and she knows the Greek alphabet and like doing the opposite of what our grandparents and our great grandparents had done, which I think is like we're doing the, they came here and we're trying to go back there to wherever there might be and trying to find that balance. And if that balance is possible and sometimes, you know, I may feel like a fraud, but I'm trying, but like, you know, it starts with food. I think the easiest way to kind of connect to a culture because sometimes language is difficult is, is through eating and trying. And it was very much like an Anthony Bourdain situation where he, what was it? something unknown places unknown where he would go in and like really talk to people and try the food and like really embrace it and it wasn't like I don't know what this is and I don't want to touch it but like really going in and understanding where the food came from why it was important how long this tradition has been going on and being respectful of it I think it's more important than anything else because sometimes what I I think the both of us have read about was that sometimes it just wasn't very respectful um, it's interesting that you brought up like Anthony Bourdain and those food and travel shows, right, of going to um, foreign places, foreign countries and trying, you know, their food and really engaging in the culture through food. Because I found this article that was talking about 19th century travel writing and how food, how travel writers were talking about food Oh no, I think I froze. Uh, <laughs> oh. uh, start over. Start yeah. over. Um, so so was ta- this article is talking about how travel writers, um, American travel writers were talking about food and how it reflected their opinions of these different places, right? So how they talk about the food in Italy versus the food in Russia, right? Italian food, and this was like, Florence. Everybody's going to Florence. Um, Italian food was like rustic but romantic, right? And their their black, their rough black bread was like so delicious. But then you go to Russia and it was, you know, terrible and the people there were dirty and you know, things like that. And it's just and the thing that fascinated me that was not touched upon in the article was the opinions towards Italians in Italy versus Italians and Italian food in the United States, Mm -hmm. right? And I wonder if some of that was because the majority of Italian immigrants at the turn of the century comes from Southern Italy Mm -hmm. versus these people are going to Florence, which is in Northern Italy, like Florence and Venice, and there's different food cultures and the language is different and maybe it's like just different enough um, obviously, there's also the fact that they're there and not here um, that that plays a part. Um, but I think that was, that was something missed in that article that I think, you know, was really interesting to kind of consider as well. Um, yeah, that's definitely something I, I found as well. Um, there weren't food critics, correspondents, as we would think of them today, but definitely those middle upper class white men traditionally I think were the ones writing these guidebooks about New York City and they would talk about their experiences of don't go here don't go there I did find one and I'll pull it up for you guys um was a Chinese dinner in New York so the whole article I pulled out a couple of just tidbits what I found um you know the three Chinese restauranteurs I long famously uh, as long as we can find ourselves to the universal language of beverages, narcotics, and general good feeling. So it's always kind of laced with this, I mean, it's blatantly racist if you're bringing up narcotics and Chinese people at this point. Um, and then, you know, kind of poking fun at the food in the last 
sentence in that last paragraph. These samples, as near as I could make out, were chunks of India rubber, dried fish of all sorts and sizes, and some things I could identify and classify 100 years from now by their odors of strange food to people who have never experienced it don't normally react well to it. And instead of being like, oh, it had a unique taste palette, it's always like a little bit more drawn out than it needs to be. And you can see in the illustration that went along with it, um, it was it, some of the articles that I was reading about were always like the Chinese dinner, the Chinese diners were always in the basement, poorly lit. There was always just one communal table. And and we'll, I will talk a little bit more, we'll expand a little bit more about this for the taproom tastings is about restaurants in March, but about how people assumed even if you were going to eat a different cuisine that you were supposed to be served a very specific American way and that always changed somebody's experience. Um, but I just, you know, gotta try. That was, that's also something that I, I looked at, um, cause you know, I found the, the archeology span articles, um, and about not just the foods people were eating, but how they were eating. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, because there was a, a push also to, to make sure that you were eating the right way, right. You had the right manners to fit in with genteel society at the time. And um, the way Americans ate was different than a lot, the way a lot of other people ate. And one of the articles I read was talking about, it, they were looking at um, the, the home of a, an Italian immigrant from um, the late 19th century and just the dishes he was using, you know, um, and the American style of, eating, you know, having, being served a plate with all your food on it already, rather than family style. Really um, different. Yeah. And also like having, and we've kind of touched on it a little bit in some of the others, like there's a dish and a utensil for everything. Right. Um, and that was very common in, at the end of the 19th century in America. Right. You had a bread plate and everybody had a butter dish and everyone had their own individual salt thingy. And, you know, you had a fork for every different type of thing you were eating, uh, which yeah. a lot of places didn't have, both because, you know, maybe they couldn't afford it um, or it just wasn't the culture. Right. And especially like you see in Chinese restaurants. Right. They the the culture is to eat family style and you just pick what you want and take what you want. But um, yeah, so it's not just the food, but also everything that kind of surrounds that as well. A lot of cultures are family style and it's not till you get to this very upper class American or I mean, British or some sort of European situation. I just, like, I grew up family style. Like you had one plate, but it was always just like, we didn't have all of the things and it wasn't very showy. And then, you know, the Ottoman alleys are kind of the same way. It's like all of the food is laid out and you don't get served. I mean, unless you're a child, right? Like then they'll give you your plate because you can't trust it to like pick out your own baked ziti, but still. Um, but I find that a lot of cultures are very family style. And I think it's just because it's that connection to the intimacy of eating with your family and having that small bubble with you, right? So it's all of your immediate family all sitting together, eating, talking about your day, what was going on, what are the problems going on, how can we fix it together? And that idea of togetherness goes along with this family style, communal style eating. Whereas I think when you get to the rig the rigid behavior of I'm thinking of Downton Abbey, unfortunately, of like we don't really talk about feelings, we don't talk about this, and we're very separated, and it's turning into an episode of The Crown almost. But like the way that you eat also has a an impact on how your family interacts with each other as well, and how close you are. And I can say Christmas dinner at the Ottoman alleys is like shoulder to shoulder and you're all just like passing around bread, yanking it off and passing it to the next person and like pulling things around. And the same with the Chalcis and the Rakutis families. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, I thought so. That I thought that was really interesting. Not something I'd thought of before when you think about different, you know, cultural cuisines. But um, it makes sense. It's part of, you know, acculturation and assimilation. Is you you want to be perceived as, you know, and then proper. Proper. Yeah. Um, the concept of proper is different. I. Yeah. We're all we're getting very theoretical tonight. I apologize. <laughs> it's the rain. It's made us a little loopy. Um, but that took me into when I was looking up the demographics for Marine Park. So I can I have some somewhere. Um, so Marine Park, where the lot beautiful Hendrick I Lot House is located, uh, was primarily Dutch. It was primarily farmland and just very very rural, um, which is is not today. Um, the neighborhood really doesn't become a hub for residents until the 1920s, 1930s, when the concept of like indoor plumbing becomes a thing and grid houses become a thing in Brooklyn. And it was truly like, if you build it, they will come. There's some, the statistic that we were able to pull was that between 1920 and 1930, Marine Park was so developed and the area saw a population increase of 1600%. So in the early 1920s, 1910s, there was probably only like two to 300 to like a thousand families living in the neighborhood. So when you think of 1930s and you have, um, I think it was close to like 15,000 people moving in, that is a very big jump. And it's literally all of these different groups who were living in Manhattan looking for the ability to own a home, still have the ability to commute to New York City, but also not be cramped in a tenement house together. And we have, I will pull it up as I would talk about it. Our board president was able to put together a few years ago, something called the Look Here Project. And she took a look, see what I did there? She took a look at all of the tax residents, tax photos from the 1940s in Marine Park to see who was living here, who owned businesses, and truly just how diverse the neighborhood was. Um, so you can see Marine Park Hardware is on Avenue F, and that was originally established as a hardware store in 1926 by Dominic Giordano, a house painter, and has been continually operated as a hardware store since its opening. So one of our lot house board members actually still owns and operates it as Marine Park Hardware, which is very, very cool. And then in the middle is Feldman's Pharmacy. So Isaac and Ethel were two Jewish immigrants from Russia and Ethel was pregnant on her trip to America when they arrived and their son was born in Brooklyn in 1888. So um, when William was an adult in 1921, he married Ava Greenstein and they moved to Marine Park in 1930 and then he established his pharmacy, pharmacy, which was operating until the 1950s. So you can see that in the middle as well. And then on the right is Tijin's Deli uh, less than three years after arriving in New York City in 1925 from Hutton, Hutton Bush, Germany, uh, he purchased the storefront property and opened a delicatessen. And more than 80 years later, the space is still operating as a deli, which is really cool. Um, so all of these businesses are within about five block radius of the lot house. And you can walk down Quentin Road and Avenue S, which are two major thoroughfares, and be able to like trace the fact that like, Marine Park was Irish. There's a large Jewish demographic. There's a large Italian demographic from the 1920s on. And it really becomes this enclave in the south of Brooklyn. So then if you look at a map of the transit system in Brooklyn, the, the train ends and then you have South Brooklyn. Um, so it really is its own self-sustaining area where we have to have everything. And sometimes it's hard to go to work. Um, but it is really... wonderful and I just because I think there's you know when you think of when you think of Brooklyn today you don't think of it as a very diverse neighborhood uh borough I should say sometimes but uh I think when you say Brooklyn nowadays because of the television you get like those weird hipsters that wear weird socks and hats and stuff that don't fully cover their ears but Brooklyn is so diverse and it has some of the best food and my favorite borough I say it because I was born and raised here though so What's my spiel?
do we want to open it up to questions? Does anything come in? I just realized. We had one comment. Yes, I saw uh, there was a yeah, chat. I think D. Whitridge says, my family has cooked a simple uh, American chop suey recipe for years. It's easy to make and delicious. Yeah. Where did they get the recipe? <laughs> this is like, I'm always interested to see like my grandmother would make shake and bake, but she would always try to like add stuff to the mix too sometimes to make it like somewhat Greek. Can I show the posters again? Absolutely, I sure can. I would love to. Bear with me because Zoom after all of these years still gets me. I have to open this screen up to open the other screen up. So these posters are from World War One. I'm imagining what this is what you're talking about. Um, these were put out from the United States Food Administration in 1917 for World War I, um, and they were put out for, you can see the Statue of Liberty in the background, so it's a very New York City-esque situation, was about food consumption and conservation um, for the war effort. So while we're talking about the concept of otherness in food and exotic um, ingredients, the United States government is also like, we'll conserve the food that you're eating because we also have to like, excuse me, we have to feed the soldiers and everybody who's overseas and all of our allies at the same time. So you can see on the right, I found the English version, food will win the war. You came here seeking freedom. You must now help to preserve it. Um, wheat is needed for the allies. And then on the left, there is a Hebrew version of it. I was able to find the colorized version of the Hebrew one, but not the English one. It's somewhere on the Library of Congress and I will find it after this ends because that is always what happens. Um, but I was reading up on these posters because I was interested to see if there was any propaganda because I was getting a lot of research about all of those progressive movements, about putting out pamphlets and posters about how you're supposed to change your dietary restrictions. And I stumbled upon these. The United States government put these posters out in over 25 different languages and they were handed out in tenement houses in New York City. Um, I was only able to find the Hebrew one on Library of Congress, but there was definitely like, I saw Greek, I saw Hungarian, I saw German. Um, I saw some Spanish ones were also printed as well that I was reading about, but I think it's just, I mean, patriotism, right? Um, but they are really like, it's a good, it's a good propaganda. I get it. It's like, you know, you're here now, but I think, so I was trying to figure out what the woman has in her basket. I am I see a green, I see a leafy green, I see a loaf of bread, and I see two containers, which I'm imagining is some sort of like carb of sorts, because I mean, me and Catherine always say like, every culture has their version of like meat in a bread. And it's always called something different. Like that's everybody's thorough line in every culture. There's always just some like meat pocket of some sort, and it's always spice different. Um, but yeah, they are pretty cool. Oh, thanks, Howard, Native Brooklyn. It's fabulous. There's always one of us. Um, and then Elizabeth Boyce asks, do you have any recommendations for books related to immigrant food influence in 19th century American cooking? Um, oh, Italian American table, anything by Harvey Levenstein? Yes. There was one I was reading. Let me take this down so we can see each other again. Um, how America Eats was interesting. A social history of the United States food and culture was interesting. Um, 19th century American cooking. Me and Catherine were coming around the same thing of when we were looking at immigrant foodways in 19th century into the 20th century. A lot of them were based in Italian foodways. Like that was the predominant one that had been studied and focused on. Um, but I will say Gastropolis was good, Food in New York City. Food and New York City by Annie Hawk Lawson was good. Um, and then there was something else that I was reading. It was like, I'll have to write, I have it somewhere. I don't just don't have it written down in my notes, but I have it saved. Modern food, moral food, but I think that's more of a like theory based kind of book. I mean, I love saying this. Go to your local library and ask your librarian because they will know all the things about all the books and they will be able to help you 
for free because it's a library and I love libraries. Yeah. Um, um, there, there are definitely a couple um, that I uh, cannot recall the titles off the top of my head. Um, I remember the authors uh, because one was Richard Pillsbury. So that one stuck in my head. <laughs> Um, and then also, I think one of the foremost kind of historians on Italian American uh, food is uh, Donna Gabaccia, um, and she has a great book. Um, so I will, when we send the recordings, well, uh, Mary and I can put a couple of, of our suggestions there too. Um, and, and Linda has put a number of suggestions in the chat as well. Um, so thank you. Linda, that's great. It's fabulous. Thank you. These all look so interesting. I don't think it's, it's interesting when we do the research and we come upon different books and they all kind of gravitate around each other, but they've never fully, like, I know when I was doing research for this, I saved certain chapters in certain books because they're going to help moving forward because everything is so interlinked by the time you get past the civil war. It's a completely different ball game from the Revolutionary War, eighteenth century. Totally different ball game, which is wonderful. I didn't have to look up. I didn't look up anything for like eighteenth century for this one, which is so exciting. Um, but yeah, it's it, you know it was one of those kind of interesting ones because it was just so theoretical and in, in the concept of what do you mean by immigrant? How do you react to it? Where has it changed? Um, it kind of got me thinking of, you know, my favorite restaurants in New York City and like they've mostly become Italian places because they're better for vegetarian options. Um, I will say, I always get this question of somebody always asks like, what's the best Greek restaurant in New York City? And I'm like, I made it at home. So we never went out to eat it. So I can't answer those questions. But I was like, I can tell you where my favorite pizza place is or my favorite like pasta spot is. Um, but yeah, it's just, we, I feel like we always come back to that conversation of a thin line of maintaining your roots and also kind of creating new ones and finding that fusion, which is really, which is really a beautiful thing to be able to do these days, because the more you read about how people were told not to be who they were, the more thankful you are that you have the opportunity to do that. And then we have the opportunity to have this conversation with everybody who joins us every time. Um, I think when you, you said, you know, your favorite restaurants all happen to be like Italian, right? Um, Italian restaurants. And that got me thinking about how there's certain foods that, and certain cultural foods that have become ingrained as part of American culture, right? And others didn't. And it, it reflects kind of the nature of, um, the immigration patterns, especially at the mm -hmm. turn of the century, when these things were, and when restaurants and kind of cafeterias and things like that were also developing um, in this nation. And so you have things like Amer uh, Italian American cuisine is now part of American cuisine, right? It's part of the name um, and American Chinese food. But you, at the same time, you don't really have Irish American food, right? Or you know, some of these other ones that are either just separate, you know, they're their own thing, or they've been absorbed into what is quote unquote American, right? Like German food, there's a lot of, you know, German influence in what we now think of as American food. Um, and I think it's really interesting because I was um, looking at some of the patterns of immigration and who was coming and what they were doing once they got here. And so you have things like the Irish, where it was a lot of single women who end up working as cooks and maids in houses. And so they're not cooking for themselves, or they're cooking for their employers. So they're making what the employer wants, which is um, American food at the time. Um, and they're, you know, eating, they're being fed at their employer's place. They're not, um, so they don't, need to really develop that uh, that cuisine of truly Irish food, I guess. Um, whereas with the Italians, you there are more women coming, 
I think it was something like 21% of Italian immigrants were women um, at the turn of the century. And whereas with the Irish, it was over 50% single women. Um, and so you wow. have families coming. The Italian women are not working outside of the house. And so they have the opportunity to kind of cement the, the um, that Italian culture into American culture. Um, and then you have on the opposite side of the country and, and the opposite side of the spectrum, you have the Chinese, right? Where it's like nine, so it's like 98% men, right? They're adult men coming over. Right. So the development of American Chinese food is very, you know, I think it's one of those that has been studied quite a bit, um, and it's also where you get into that idea of what is authentic, right? Because one of the things I was always asked is like, what is, you know, where do you get authentic Chinese food? And I was like, not in the United States. Um, I mean, now you can, but, and, uh, but there is, you know, um, Chinese food in America is very different from Chinese food in China um, in enormous ways. And a lot of it is... Um, because it was developed by American Chinese food was developed by men who mostly did not have, uh, you know, they were self-taught and they're basically using American ingredients uh, with Chinese cooking methods, but they're also catering to their customers, right? They're catering to the American miners and railroad workers that they were feeding. And so right. that's where you get things like chop suey that have all these vegetables that you don't find in China. Um, and you get things like up in Boston and, and Massachusetts area where you get the chow mein sandwich um, and things yeah. like that. Um, but also General's House chicken, right? And all of these like creamy sauces that you would- Fortune cookies. In China. Fortune cookies, which were developed in Japan. Uh, which is so crazy because when I when I went to San Francisco, all of those things of where to go eat, they're like, you have to go try fortune cookies that are handmade in Chinatown. And I was just like, they're not from here. They're like authentic. Um, the, the word authentic. It's not always authentic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was another really interesting thing is like that, that whole idea of authenticity. And can you really create authentic, you know, whatever insert culture food in the United States, if you don't have the same ingredients or you have, you're using different cooking methods um, or you can approximate tastes and things like that. And you're also kind of, you're filtering it through memory too, right? Um, there's always that bit. Um, and there's one article that was talking about like who who defines what is authentic, right? The UNESCO, the United Nations, um, they have their list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity, right? And a lot of is like certain types of food. I think the ba the baguette, French baguette was put on that list recently. Um, and like, does that then define what is an authentic baguette? And it only can be that thing that one way of making a baguette or whatever it might be. Um, and so like who, who gets to define what is authentic? Um, yeah, that definitely dives into, we didn't have time to talk about this, but probably deserves its own episode of, and I'm thinking of Tex-Mex as like a good example of two cultures kind of mixing together to make text like, Texas and Mexican food but like what is Texas food and you start having those conversations and where those lines are drawn up like you were saying authenticity of does it change and that kind of concept it's all it becomes a very theoretical conversation we start talking about the the broadness of immigrant food ways and it's a lot to cover um we I hope that somebody walks away with like a different thought process when they go out to eat dinner someplace in the next couple of weeks and go, oh, interesting. I appreciated this. Um, but yeah, there was definitely a lot of 
hierarchy of authenticity that I was reading about, depending on who wrote it at the time period that it was written, especially when you're looking at those food they're not bloggers because it's the early 20th century, but those food critics and those people who are writing the guidebooks of where to go, where not to go, what you should eat, what you should avoid. And it was, I, you know, I try not to tone check a lot as a historian, but sometimes you have to. And sometimes you just look back and you were like, you were just going in just to make a point, just to sell pages in your tour book and not because you were genuinely interested in trying any of this food. Food's really so good. <laughs> I love trying new food. Yeah. All right, we've got a few minutes left uh, in the hour. So if anybody has any um, other questions or comments they'd like to pop in the chat, uh, they're welcome to do that. Um, I thought I would um, share some photos that I found of um, some food from Ridgefield. Um, so mm -hmm. Ridgefield at the turn of the 20th century had a lot of uh, Italian immigrants uh, coming here. And um, so here I have a couple what? of photos um, from a, a book of oral history. And so here we have a bunch of men making uh porchetta here um which they look like they're having a lot of fun uh and so in uh at the turn of the century in ridgefield the italians they a lot of families came um they very much gathered in um various neighborhoods in town uh and it was very much a not an insular community but it was you know a, a community um and so then here we have one of the things that a lot of people mention in their oral histories was that every family kind of had a um a pig and so oh. there were a lot of photos of pig butchering and there's a lot of talk about butchering pigs and that was something that every the families did because it would feed you for the rest of the year um and and i love this little boy in the corner here with his dad. It's a very Ottomanelli situation that you're <laughs> talking about right now. I just want to say. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, we talked about how there was a lot mm -hmm. of frustration that, right, the the immigrants were importing their goods and they were, um, and a lot of the immigrants in, I found in New York and Connecticut too, um, oops, tended to uh, become merchants, right? And, and they were produce sellers and, and grocery store owners. And so here are two grocery stores that were in Ridgefield, Brunetti and Gasparini. Um, and then down in Branchville, right by the railway station um, was another area where the Italians kind of settled. Um, and you can see there's a general store. They have fruit, groceries, and ice cream um, at the Branchville oh. store. Uh, so that was a nice picture. And then lastly, uh, Ridgefield had an Italian American mutual aid society where they, they kind of, oh. you know, the Italian American club, um, that would have banquets and foods. And that's another way of kind of developing and, and maintaining those, cult, uh, you know, foods because you, at these meals, you kind of want to, reinforce those cultural connections through um through the shared foods so um here in ridgefield most people came from the same place in italy uh so i think there was a lot of similarity in the cuisine but you can see in a lot of other writings that part of the reason italian american cuisine became what it is is because they um you know all of these different place regions of Italy who have all of a sudden just been grouped as Italian, right? And places that historically are completely different. They have different um, you know, histories and language dialects and and food and stuff. All of a sudden they're just all Italian. And so uh one of the ways is really to to build um that community that they've kind of been forced into in a way. Um, how close was the Italian community in relation to where Keeler Tavern is located? 
Um, so there are a couple of different parts of town. Um, so Branchville is kind of down the, the ridge, um, but it's it's not far, um, two two miles, something like that. Okay. Um, and, um, so relatively close. And the Italians, um, to answer Linda's question, why did they come to Ridgefield? Uh, they came up on the railway. Uh, they were working on the railway and they, a lot of them did end up settling here as masons and gardeners um, for the, the bigger estates around here. Um, and uh, so they ended up coming to, to uh, this area and settling down and now uh, have built a, a very, very big community. They're a big part of Ridgefield's community um, today. So uh yeah, and, and now um, we have lots of Italian restaurants. <laughs> What's the problem, Catherine? No, there's no problem. <laughs> I'm very thankful for the Italian restaurants here. Um, yeah. Anybody have any last questions, comments, concerns? We will put together a small bibliography of our food ways, suggestions um, with the email that goes out as well. Um. Uh, yeah, so Hildy, Hildy asked me to mention the new tour. Um, one of the things that we are developing here at Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center is a new tour based in the 20th century um, when the house was owned by the Gilbert family. And, um, but we are exploring not just the Gilberts, but the other, everybody who worked here um, on, on the property and it's exploring the interconnections between the Gilberts and kind of the wealthier summer people, the longtime Ridgefield residents, um, and then also the the newcomers, the Italian immigrants, as well as the Irish and the Scottish and um, and many of the all the other immigrants that came to Ridgefield um, and how that uh, they they interacted here at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and one of the things we're talking about is kind of using food as one of the ways of connecting these people because everybody needs to eat. <laughs> um, so so food is definitely um, a, an important super interesting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the Gilberts threw a lot of like big parties here. And so, you know, that you have the people, the merchants in town who tended to be the old time immigrants, or the old timers, um, right? And so they're providing food and you have the uh, immigrants who are cooking the food. The Gilberts had a Scottish chef named, a uh, cook named Margaret Ross who worked for them for over 50 years. Um, and, you know, you have people serving the food and then, you have the Gilberts eating it. So um, definitely is one way to connect connect people. So uh, keep your eye out for news about that tour. It's it's still in progress, but um, we're, we're getting ready to launch it. So uh, yeah. And uh, I did want to mention as we wrap up, um, I did find in my research, uh, the National Council for H History Education um, at the end of February is having a Zoom talk on immigrant foodways in the progressive era. Um, by, I don't know this woman, Sarah Wasper Johnson is the speaker. She's called the food historian. Um, apparently she's been on like the food that built America, that history channel show and things like that. Um, and she's writing a book. So, uh, that was something I found I'm going to be listening. Um, I don't know if anyone else is interested, but I uh, just pop the the link to that in the chat. Um, and hopefully she doesn't refute anything. <laughs> no, um, I'm confident in we're, our We're doing our best. We're doing our best. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, if no one has any other uh, immediate questions, uh, we'll wrap up. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we love having you guys every month. We love seeing you every month. And uh, we will be back next month, Feb uh, 
what is it, February 13th, the day before yes. Valentine's Day. Um, and we will be talking about dairy. So milk, cheese, we might revisit some of our, some things from our ice cream episode, um, things like that. Um, Cause Connecticut surprisingly had, had a, has a history in dairy. So um, <laughs> we'll be exploring that. 